Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I <laughs> uh, hope you all are well. Thanks for your patience. Uh, as you can see, I have with me today Jason Furman, the Chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, because I know there is interest in today's uh, CBO report, uh, I asked Jason to join me. Uh, he will uh, say a few words at the top, then take questions from you on uh, that subject and others related to his expertise. Uh, I like Tom Sawyer. I enjoy having other people paint fences for me, so it's good to have Jason here uh, to do this work. And I will stand by for questions on other subjects. So if you uh, go take all your questions related to uh, matters that uh, Jason uh, uh, handles uh, at the top, I'll be here uh, for when he goes. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Jay. Wanted to start with um, the main thing that the CBO report is about, which is about the federal budget. And it confirms the very substantial near-term improvements that the United States has made in its deficit. In particular, it finds that the deficit last year was 4.1 percent of GDP. That's cutting the deficit the President inherited in half and the fastest pace of deficit reduction since the demobilization from World War II. The CBO report also finds that the deficit will continue to decline in the near term, falling by another $200 billion in the next two years, falling to 2.6 percent of GDP. That number is important because from the very beginning, the President's economic team and the President thought that the most important goal in fiscal policy was to ensure that your debt was falling as a share of the economy, and having deficits below 3 percent of GDP are consistent with that goal. CBO does also find um, and confirm that there is, over the medium and long term, still a substantial deficit challenge, and that's why you're going to see the President's budget once again, as it has in previous years, continue to propose deficit reduction over the medium and long run as it makes investments in jobs and priorities um, as well. Turning now to Appendix C of the report, since that <laughs> seems to have attracted some interest from some people, can give you a little bit of context for the impact the Affordable Care Act has had on labor markets and will have on labor markets and the economy going forward. First, since the Affordable Care Act has passed, the private sector has added 8.1 million jobs. That's the fastest pace of private sector job growth since the late 1990s, and I think that fully puts to rest a lot of the more overwrought predictions about how the sky would fall and um, the economy would be deeply damaged by the Affordable Care Act. Um, turning now to this report, CBO itself says that in a very important ways, the Affordable Care Act today, right now, is helping labor markets, is helping businesses, and is helping jobs. And in particular, what CBO finds is that the tax credits for health coverage, Medicaid will help put more money in people's pockets, help them able to spend more, and that will provide a boost to the economy. To give you the full quote, quote, the expanded federal subsidies for health insurance will stimulate demand for goods and services, and that effect will mostly occur over the next few years. That increase in demand will induce some employers to hire more workers or to increase their employees' hours during that period. Um, very importantly, we have seen many claims that the Affordable Care Act is impacting the job market today. For example, numerous allegations that it's increased part-time employment. CBO refutes that, saying, quote, in CBO's judgment, there is no compelling evidence that part-time employment has increased as a result of the ACA. That is what um, the ACA is doing to labor markets um, in the near term right now, the economy today. Finally, the report 
talks about what happens to labor markets over time, which the report defines as 2017 through 2024. That, too, refutes one of the main um, attacks and criticisms against the Affordable Care Act, which is that it would lead employers to shed jobs, that it would lead employers to dramatically cut back on hours and increase um, the unemployment rate. In fact, what CBO found, and this is their summary quote near the top of Appendix C, again, quote, the estimated reduction, um, this is the reduction in the total quantity of labor that all of you have, uh, all of you have seen and talked about, um, quote, the estimated reduction stems almost entirely from a net decline in the amount of labor that workers choose to supply rather than from a net drop in businesses' demand for labor. What's relevant about that is their word itself is choose. This is a choice on the part of workers. And I have no doubt that if, for example, we got rid of Social Security and Medicare, there are many 95-year-olds that would choose to work more to avoid you know, potentially starving or to give themselves an opportunity to get health care. I don't think anyone would say that was a compelling argument to eliminate um, Social Security and Medicare. Similarly here, CBO's analysis itself um, is about the choices that workers are making in the face of new options afforded to them by the Affordable Care Act, not something about firms destroying jobs. The final thing I'd like to say is that CBO themselves stress that their analysis um, is not complete, it doesn't reflect the full set of factors, and um, that there's substantial uncertainty around their analysis. <laughs> in particular, I think there's three very important ways that the Affordable Care Act is and will continue to improve labor markets that weren't reflected here. The first is an increase in the productivity of workers because of fewer sick days, um, less disability, um, and generally improved productivity as a result. The second is something the Council of Economic Advisors has done a report on, which is contributing to the slowest pace of per capita health spending growth in the last 50 years. Um, that slowest pace into the last 50 years is a fact. Um, we documented the ways in which the Affordable Care Act is one of the important factors that has contributed to that slowdown. What that does is it helps employers in the short and medium run. It lowers some of their compensation costs, help them hire more workers. And then finally, by giving people more security in terms of their health care, it reduces what economists call job lock, or more colloquially, gives more opportunities for entrepreneurism and um, moving from job to job. In addition to that, as I said, there's a lot of uncertainty. I think economists would debate some of the assumptions here, and I'd expect there to be a robust debate around things like how much workers respond to a set of phase-outs that in other parts of social programs you generally haven't um, seen people respond to in some of the degrees assumed here. But regardless of that, as I said, this report confirms the ACA um, is, has, um, it has, is making positive impacts today in very important ways. It refutes some of the arguments about how it has hurt the labor market today or will hurt it in the future. And it confirms what we've all known, which is when you do something like that, it gives people new choices and new options. And people will sometimes make different choices um, in the face of new choices and new options. Yeah. I, I guess that you think that this report refutes the idea that it's going to be businesses that are cutting back on jobs, but even if some of these nearly two and a half million people who are going to leave full-time jobs are doing it because they're choosing to, doesn't th just the sheer idea of losing two and a half million jobs over ten years have a negative <coughs> economic impact? Right. First of all, two things. One is I, you know, every month go out on TV to talk about the jobs numbers. Every month, pretty much every one of you that does television in here asks me the question, you know, if something bad happened last month, wasn't that because of the Affordable Care Act? Or there's been an increase in part-time employment lately, which was true in the spring. It actually hasn't been true in the last couple of months. Isn't that because of the Affordable Care Act? So over and over again, there has been the claim that the Affordable Care Act is impacting the labor market today. Um, this uh, refutes that. In the long run, First of all, as I said, getting rid of Social Security and Medicare would cause more 95-year-olds to work. 
we don't think that would be an effective economic strategy for boosting the economy or particularly wise policy. So you can, you know, ask that question in the context here. Second of all, the um, you know, numbers themselves don't incorporate some of the important ways in which this does help labor markets by improving productivity, reducing the growth of health care, reducing job lock, and thus increasing entrepreneurialism. So I think when you look at the Affordable Care Act as a whole, um, it's good for the economy and gives more choices to but people. isn't the report basically saying that the Affordable Care Act will have the impact on the labor market of reducing full-time employment by 2.5 million jobs over the next 10 years? The report finds that there will be less, that workers will choose to supply less labor, correct? It, it's, it describes that as a choice. Again, it's not that the businesses are cutting those jobs. If you're losing that many jobs, I, and I'm really just trying to understand this, right. if you're losing that many jobs, regardless of why you're losing them, doesn't that have some kind of negative impact on the economy? Two things. One, just a small picky thing. Um, it doesn't say losing jobs. It says FTEs, so to some degree this might be somebody who used to work 60 hours because they needed health insurance and that was the only job that offered it, and now they can get a different job at 35 hours that doesn't offer health insurance, but they're getting it through this, and they're switching from one to the other, and that's a better choice for that person, and this has given them that option that they didn't used to have. Um, as I said, you wouldn't judge whether Social Security and Medicare are good or bad based on what they do to labor supply. I'm not contesting that fewer 95-year-olds work because of those programs. So I don't think that's the total way in which anyone would look at anything that we choose to legislate and judge it. But finally, I'm not necessarily saying that the, that the 2.5 million number gives a complete picture of all of the myriad effects of the Affordable Care Act. CBO says, you know, for example, the ACA could also alter labor productivity, the amount of output generated per hour, which in turn would influence employment. And then it says, you know, that their report isn't taking into account factors like that because they're harder to quantify and be sure about. That's not the same as saying it doesn't matter. Yeah. Jason, do you, do you refute any of the data that the report is, is using? I CBO does excellent work. We cite CBO all the time. I wouldn't say anything other than that about them. I would say no matter how excellent any organization's work is, number one, um, it's subject to be misinterpreted. And a lot of what I've been talking about here is the way that this has been interpreted. But number two, an analysis can only take into account so many things. This analysis by design looked at a set of labor market effects. It didn't look at another set of labor market effects. And I talked about what those three e effects were. I think in particular that slowdown in health costs is something that put in the language of uh, CBO would increase labor demand and be quite an important factor. So that's the second point. And then the third point I'd make is that CBO themselves says that there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty. A lot of the report stems from as tax credits phase out, what does that do to people's um, incentives? There's a literature on the earned income tax credit that has generally found that the phase out of the earned income tax credit doesn't affect labor supply. CBO is assuming that in this context, people will have a much better understanding of these phase outs and alter their behavior in response to it to a much greater degree than we've seen in the context of the earned income tax credit. I suspect you know, CBO itself would say that there's uncertainty around that, and I suspect, you know, that's one of the many assumptions that one could debate um, in this report. But you, you don't dispute, or do you dispute the conclusion, one of the main conclusions that we've talked about already, that some people would choose to go part-time so as not to lose the subsidies that are <coughs> part of the design of the ACA? I think there is no dispute that the Affordable Care Act provides people with new options and that people who today are doing a set of things because they don't have options and choices will be able to do uh, new things that they would not have otherwise chosen to do, in many cases not have been able to do. There are puts and takes and, you know, this is describing the net effect of that put and take, you know, in terms of whether 
um, this number is the most accurate net effect. Again, I think there's a number of other effects you'd want to factor in. There's a lot of uncertainty you know, you'd want to think about um, in that regard. And that ultimately you're not going to look at something you know, and judge it entirely by the impact on labor supply, first of all. And second of all, if you want to judge it entirely by the impact on labor supply, you're going to want to take into account a fuller analysis than just what was seen here and reflect also the uncertainty around that analysis. CBO is a nonpartisan agency. Do you see this report as partisan in any way? I think CBO does, you know, consistently does outstanding work and I think this report is, you know, mainstream economics, but I think like mainstream economics, it doesn't take into account uh, it's subject to misinterpretation, doesn't take into account every factor, and there's uncertainty and debate around it. And I think one of those key debates is the responsiveness to uh, uh, of that labor supply would actually have in this context to phase out rates. Thank you. Graham. Thank you. Um, you talk about a choice, you're, you're using that word, and, and when you're talking about a choice, it makes me think of a calculation that some families make where uh, the mom or the dad decides they're not going to uh, go back to work because they look at child care costs, it becomes so expensive it doesn't really make sense financially <coughs> for them to go to work. Is it a choice or is it a calculation that some people are making where some people may actually want to work but the benefit they're receiving may discourage them from doing that? Um, first of all, the word choice is, I, I have been using that word a lot. Um, a lot of my use of that word has also been in the quote. So if you, uh, when you read Appendix C, you'll see throughout it, it talks a lot about the labor that workers choose to supply. And it actually says there's no increase choice in unemployment. And the right. choice in well, is let's, a calculation. Let's give an, let's right? give an example from, from, from Medicaid, for example. There's some evidence that if you have just a single person, Medicaid is not going to impact their choice about working. And that's because if you are the only breadwinner in your family, because you're the only person in your family, you're going to need to have a job. You're going to need to work. There have been studies that have found that if two people are married and they get Medicaid, that that might um, lead a spouse who otherwise would have gotten a job and worked really hard to buy health care for the whole family, might not need to get a full-time job, might get a part-time job and have more time to spend with their children as a result of the new option they have for health care. That is one of the types of choices that people would have now that they wouldn't necessarily um, have had before. And that's one of the choices in the types of studies that CBO is relying on in making this finding. Jason, on your example, when you were talking about somebody making a uh, working 60 or 65 hours a week, and they might now be able to work, camera <coughs> views 30 or 35 mm -hmm. hours a week, and they'd have health insurance, just an example. So mm -hmm. it's a good thing that they now have health care. Maybe they didn't before. But isn't that man or woman going from 60 or 65 no, no. hours to 30? I'm they're saying, making less money, right? Oh, I'm saying if they, yeah, if the main thing going on here was a change in labor demand, and labor demand, just to be clear, that is the decision that employers are making. So employers are cutting jobs because of the Affordable Care Act. That would be a bad thing because that means somebody who really wanted a job wouldn't be able to get one. You might see the unemployment rate go up as a result of that, for example. CBO explicitly says that you're not going to see an increase in the unemployment rate, that when you see changes, it'll be that person who maybe didn't want to work those hours. They still have the option to. They still can. But in that case, maybe they'll decide they don't need to anymore. And that, in their case, might be a better choice and a better option than sure. what they had before. If they make that choice and they go from 60 to 30, 35 hours, presumably that family's going to have a lot less take-home pay. Oh. And they're going to have less money to put back into the economy. Great. But we just described that example. I mean, first of all, it's a hypothetical example. But well, it's your hypothetical. Right, it is my hypothetical. Okay. That, is, that, is, that is completely <laughs> fair. Um, Again, it's a, ch it's a choice they're making. This doesn't, they had something before, which was a 65-hour job and maybe no health care or no great health care options. You now give them a new option they didn't have, a brand new thing. It's, you know, m option to buy in the marketplace. It is subsidies through that. Maybe it's Medicaid if their income is low enough. They still have everything they had before, labor demand 
hasn't changed. They still have that job. They can still go to that job. They can still do that. But you give them this extra new thing, you can't have made that person worse off. If they make a new choice, it's because they're, um, you know, in economic language, they're optimizing subject to a new constraint, right, but it and be they're making their themselves family, better like, off. Work hours wise, it might be better for the family to have health insurance, I, but a lot less take home pay. Wouldn't you go from sixty to thirty? But they, in my example, the are you person make more money if you go from no, sixty to thirty, or I'm just no. trying to follow the math. Some people may choose to. You know, I'm not going to sit here and go give a list of 140 million Americans and tell you how many hours each of them should work, and that's not what the Affordable Care, except maybe you, Carl. Uh, I don't. Uh, you know, I, um, that's not what the Affordable Care Act does. The Affordable Care Act says you can do just what you did before, um, you know, in this regard, with some puts and takes, but sort of in aggregate, you can basically do the same thing you did before, but now you have this new thing you didn't used to have. If because of this new thing, you make a different choice than you used to, you are, by definition, not worse off. There's no way you have a set of stuff you can make exactly the same choice you made before, and now I give you something else that you could be, that you're worse off as a result of that. Doesn't, Jason, that incentivize, though, some people to do less? Then all of a sudden there's an incentive to do less because if your salary is less, you're still getting government subsidies right. that then benefit. First of all, for many people, there's potentially an incentive to do more. There's an incentive for more entrepreneurship because you're not locked into a job. There's an incentive for, hire, for employers to be able to hire more people because the cost of health care is lower, there's an incentive to hire workers who are going to be absentee less. So I think there's a whole bunch of puts and takes but here that we need to take into that account. job lock, isn't there? <coughs> there's that as a result, the job lock is that you're stuck in a job, so you're afraid to pursue other things, entrepreneurial opportunities, and other jobs because you need the job for work. That, the that's the situation before the Affordable Care Act. Right. And so now, now that situation has been, the Affordable Care Act effectively solves that. and creates a situation where you can be more dynamic and, and can be more, more more mobile. Or be less dynamic, right? Because if you do less and you potentially have a lower salary and you get more government subsidies that then right. help provide for you in that, right. then... Right. The basic premise here is that people have more choices in the same way that Social Security and Medicare give retirees more choices than they'd have today. And on net, as I said, there's a whole lot of puts and takes, but this is an extra choice people have, and that's not making somebody worse off to give them an option they didn't have before. Jason, I just want to be clear with your Social Security and Medicare example. So you're saying it may be a good thing if there are two million fewer workers. I'm not saying I ex – I am not saying that I accepted that number. I think there's a whole – range of factors that go into estimating that number, some of which were captured here, some of which weren't, some of which are uh, subject to uncertainty, first of all. Second of all, I think it is, just step back here. How many articles have we read? How many people have gone out and said, the Affordable Care Act is causing businesses to cut back on jobs. But the it's strange. Like, this to this is not. That, so that, that, that's no, no, that's no, a, no not, not just a the part analogy. time. The number of times Republican has said, you know, they are strangling the economy and regulation from the Affordable Care Act, and employers can't create jobs, and it's killing jobs, and employers can't have jobs. This directly now, goes right. against all of that. It raises a, you know, and it raises a different set of issues around when you give people options, what choices they make uh, with those options. But, but to go back to this, this thing, whether it's two million, you, you don't dispute that there will be fewer people working full-time jobs as I a result haven't of the done care, do you? Do you find anything to dispute in the numbers that are, that are presented here? Yeah, I have gone through that several times. CBO itself says that they take into account some set of factors and analyze those. There's another set of factors they don't take into account all of which go the other direction. And there's uncertainty around, in particular, the key question of the degree to which people will understand and respond to you know, a, a set of phase outs in a way that we haven't seen elsewhere. So no, I'm not accepting the you know, numerical uh, premise here. But do you, you don't dispute the idea that there'll be fewer full-time workers, though. I mean, some people will choose. This was your whole point of your Medicare and Social Security example, right? That some people will choose not to work so they no longer are locked into a job to, to get health coverage. I, I thought that was part of your argument. Yeah. 
part of it is even if the net result of this is a reduction in labor supply, to the degree that reduction in labor supply is voluntary and reflects the choices people are making, you're going to think about that very differently than if it was businesses cutting back on jobs. This is not businesses cutting back on jobs. This is people having new choices they didn't used to have. Those are two completely different things in terms of the impact it has on people, first of all. Second of all, if you ask the net effect on this on you know, overall labor in the economy, you would want to take into account that other set of factors, quantify them, put them into that analysis. CBO hasn't done that, but economists um, David Cutler ensued, and he's one of the leading health economists in the country. When he did that, for example, he said that lower health costs would add 250 to 400,000 jobs per year towards the middle to end of this decade, and that's based on just the slowdown in health costs and what it would do to jobs. This is by way of saying there are a number of different things um, that you want to factor in here that um, we haven't seen factored in in uh, Appendix C. But, but just one more. So you're saying that one of those choices is the choice not to be employed or the choice to be unemployed? Somebody who used to be in a job they didn't want to be in just because that was the only way of getting health insurance for their family may be able to be in a better job for them. Maybe a spouse who wanted to be part-time so they could spend more time with their family now is able to do that. Somebody else who wanted to start a business and become an entrepreneur and was terrified of doing it because they'd lose their health insurance um, is now able to do that too and switch and take a chance on creating jobs and, and growing the overall economy. So there's a lot of new choices um, that this will facilitate. Jason, do that more complete analysis that you say is missing from the CBO report, taking in the entrepreneurship and the you know, the other benefits that you're referencing? Um, I don't have a particular plan on that at this point. Roger. Jason, Can I, ask, um, um, I want to go back to the... Uh, I want to ask about the subsidies here. You said that the... Roger, then Bill. Right, sorry. The, the subsidies were the one of the main things that are causing workers to make these decisions. For example, the 60-hour worker going down to 40 now. If you do that, mm -hmm. are there... But you've mentioned other factors, too. What, what would be some of those other factors... Uh, causing people to make these decisions? The CBO does a set of, incorporates a set of classical labor market factors in terms of looking at phase out rates of credit schedules and pass throughs and you know things of the like and those are classic standard things to analyze. Um, I, I've been a little bit repetitive about the things that they didn't include but I think the three that I think are most important are that slowdown in health costs which in the long run, it's passed on to workers in the form of higher wages. There is substantial research that shows in the short and medium run, a slowdown in health costs will also reduce compensation for employers. That'll increase the demand for labor by employers, or more colloquial, that will create jobs. And that's the 250 to 400,000 that Cutler and Sood found. That's number one. Number two, um, reduced absenteeism and increased um, and reduce disability. And you've seen some cross-national studies that have looked at these types of factors. And, um, you know, and, and you had something like the Oregon Health Experiment, for example, which found reductions in depression um, associated with people getting Medicaid. If that's going to be the case, those people are probably going to show up at work and be more productive on the job, and um, that'll, that'll help the economy. And then the final factor is this um, job lock or entrepreneurialism, that you don't need to get stuck in a job just to have health insurance, and that's really important because what matters for the economy is people who are going to the job that's best for them, that they're most productive in, and that may be also choosing to be an entrepreneur, and the Affordable Care Act facilitates that. And at the top, you said that the President's budget coming out March 4 would uh, continue to propose deficit cuts. Are you talking about net, net deficit cuts, or are you talking about cutting some here but raising it here? Every, I don't want to lift the curtain on the budget the president is going to put out, but every budget he's put out to date has, on net over the medium and long term, reduced the deficits from what would otherwise have happened if you continued along current policy. And we should expect that that will continue. I don't want to lift the curtain on any specific, but that um, 
And in the State of the Union, in fact, he said uh, something to the effect of we need to do more deficit reduction um, and do it in a balanced manner while making investments. Alexis. Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I did say Bill, then Alexis. Uh, so I'm going to uh, then take it over where Roger was. You said we are now at 4.1% of GDP with a deficit and, and heading toward 2.6%. What is the ideal considered among economists as a percentage? <laughs> The most important thing is that you're getting your debt down as a share of the economy and that, that it's on a downward path, says that you're fiscally sustainable. And deficits under about 3% of GDP are generally consistent with getting your debt down. And I want to be completely clear. CBO finds that the debt as a share of the economy after about 2017 or 2018, I can't remember the exact year, does start to rise as a share of the economy. So they are not saying we have solved our fiscal problems. They continue to confirm um, that we do have a medium and long run fiscal challenge. What they do find, though, is that deficit reduction in the last four years, and that again in the near term over the next couple of years, we're going to continue on a, a strong downward path. So I guess my question, if you're already at 4.1 and you're heading to 2.6 and you've got 15 million Americans out of work, why, why the fixation on more deficits cutting? Why not uh, an emphasis on more stimulus or more spending to boost the economy. Right. It seems you can um, afford it. This, you right. you I mean, succeeded in getting the deficit down. Right. Again, if you looked at the State of the Union, the President was talking about things like more investment in infrastructure, about other um, fiscal policies that would help growth and help job creation. And in the past, we've always shown how you can do that um, while also, over the medium and long run, um, dealing with your deficit. Alexis. Jason, I have three quick questions. One, I just to follow up, um, CEA and OMB do not have any plans to produce your own economic analysis of ACA related to the work that CBO has completed. Uh, there are no plans. We have done a very extensive analysis of the impact the Affordable Care Act has had on the growth of health costs, and that itself is an important um, economic input, but we don't, there's no plan to, to do this analysis. The second question is, it, am I understanding what you're saying correctly, that the, um, that the change in incentives for people is not a net drag on economic growth? I'm saying... If 2.5 million people change their choice about working, mm -hmm. Right. That is not a net drag on economic growth. Right. First of all, I haven't accepted the number. There's a lot of factors that go into that number, uh, not all of them in uncertainty. And second of all, I'm saying that that whole analysis refutes the claim that this is about employers cutting back on jobs and increase in unemployment, and that has been a central <laughs> argument against the Affordable Care Act. Instead, it's this analysis itself which isn't a complete analysis, but this analysis itself is about the choices um, that people make and but the new options that question. they have. But you didn't answer my question. I, I could repeat that again, if that would help. But you, you're talking about something different. You're talking about the choices that employers make, and CBO is talking about the choices that workers make. So I was asking you if workers choose to take a federal supplied incentive and not work. I guess partly I don't, I think that, I think once you think about, once you, I think the question again, when to use my Social Security Medicare example, I don't think that the right question is would we increase people's choices about working by repealing Social Security and Medicare. I don't think that's the right way to think about that. I think you want to think about that as what does that do for workers, what does that do for retirees, what does that do for people with disabilities, um, well, and what options does it, does it give them. Medicare and Social Security are aimed at primarily people of a certain age, seniors. So when you talk about older people, that's a whole separate equation than the ACA. That this is a group of human beings who are in, in a program mm -hmm. that are of all ages. Right. First of all, this number itself is a small percentage of the overall economy. Second of all, this number itself purports, I mean not purports, is about effectively choices of people. And third, it doesn't reflect the full set of factors 
um, that, that go into it. So again, I mean, the, our economic strategy, if you look at what some of the challenges we have in our economy, one of the challenges has been the growth rate of health costs. To part of how you deal with the growth rate of health costs is dealing with some of the you know, things that were causing that growth rate of health costs. And some of that was the way in which um, our policies were constructed vis-a-vis um, you know, -vis employers and vis-a-vis -vis the public provision of, of health insurance. The Affordable Care Act makes really important changes in that regard, and in that regard is contributing to slower health cost growth. And I think, you know, if anything, that's probably the number one thing I would look at in the Affordable Care Act to ask about the overall economic impact. Because if it is slowing the growth of health costs, then it gives you a set of better options than you had before all around. The federal government can save money, employers can save money, workers can save money, there can be more incentive to work, sort of net, net good. And so, you know, in thinking about is the Affordable Care Act helping the economy, I think that's the important question. And in that regard, you know, I would answer the question, uh, yes. And one more follow-up, puts and takes. For those of us who are used to that in options trading, what the heck do you mean? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm saying there's a lot of different, there's a lot of provisions in the Affordable Care Act. A lot of them will create different incentives here and there. I'm not saying that no one anywhere will have any, you know, no employer will have any new incentive to do anything. Um, there'll be some that will have, you know, an incentive to increase something here, to decrease something there, to raise something, to lower something, to do something different. There will be different, um, you know, incentives. On net, though, that aggregates out to something that is, quote, slightly effect, unquote, was um, CBO's word, um, labor demand or what employers are doing. Just to follow up on this, if you can't answer Elizabeth's <coughs> question by saying no, how do you answer Republicans who now have this big piece of evidence that they can wave to say, aha, the ACA, bad for the economy? If you can't say that this isn't... 2.5 million fewer <coughs> full-time workers isn't a net drag. How do you counter what is a really convenient shorthand that they now can trumpet to say, I told you so? And they First already of all, are. Right, I, 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 I just thought you all would be interested in Appendix C and wanted to bring it to your attention in case you hadn't noticed it. Um, the Affordable Care Act had three primary goals. One was related to coverage, one was related to quality, and one was related to cost. Insofar as you are asking about the economic impact of the Affordable Care Act, what it does to job creation, what it does to income, what it does to the overall economy, I think overwhelmingly the most important factor there is what does it do to the cost of health care. And I think the evidence is very clear that it is slowing the growth of the cost of health care and in that way is helping the overall economy and raising incomes. That is the, you know, there's a lot of things one could analyze, but in terms of the biggest and most important one, I think it's that. So I don't think there is any problem at all uh, making, and you know, I just made a very clear argument that the Affordable Care Act is good for the economy. So you think it's a settled and matter And it's good for wages and incomes and, and for the economy overall. But you're saying it's a settled matter that the decrease that we've seen in health care costs is due to the ACA. You think that's No, no, I think it is. Uh, that, there's obviously debate around that proposition. I think, to me, I think the, over, the evidence is very clear that that is the case. And, you know, I'll do the two-second version, and, and we have a whole report on it, and I'm... I'm you know, we're happy to follow up with people about that report. Um, it is indisputable that health costs are growing at the slowest pace they have in 50 years. That is measured in real per capita terms. I don't think the recession, many said that was the reason. I don't think that is the um, increasingly the main reason. And that's because we're now five years past the recession. We are um, seeing a slowdown in Medicare, which is not very affected by the overall economy. And we're seeing a big slowdown in health prices um, as measured by a couple different price indices, and those also aren't affected by recessions um, as much as quantities are. That's ruling out 
that explanation or the, that as a total explanation. In terms of the Affordable Care Act, we have CBO just this year said that this year it would reduce spending by two tenths. That's the growth rate over the last couple of years, which in health world is actually a decent amount. That's just the direct effect of Medicare. If you take into account spillovers to the private sector and assume three quarters of that spills over, then it is six tenths off the growth rate of health care prices. And none of that takes into account things like um, that are coming online, like the Innovation Center, like the benefits of reduced readmissions, 130,000 readmissions. Um, averted and the whole range of things in the affordable care, afford, accountable care organizations that are designed to better integrate care, you know, all of these innovations and delivery system reforms that are coming online. So you take all that into account, I think it's slowing the growth of health costs, slowing the growth of health costs, you know, most important economic variable here. Just a couple more. Yeah. Yes. So the benefit that you just described, slowing the growth in health care costs, is going to balance out whatever the number is, CBOs or yours or someone else's, of the lost number of people who will be earning money, contributing to the economy, helping their families, and paying taxes by virtue of less work, even if it's by choice. Now, first of all, if you look at the fiscal impact of the Affordable Care Act, you know, that's also positive, and we know that's going to reduce the deficit by more than a trillion dollars. So you, know, you, went, you went to some fiscal things in that set of arguments. We reduced the growth of health costs. And again, I think that matters. I think job lock matters. I think the productivity of workers matter. I think all of those factors matter. And I think regardless, so, so first of all, I think all of those factors matter. And second of all, this at its core refutes the notion that businesses are not going to add jobs because of the Affordable Care Act. You seem to be dismissing the effect of even if it's by choice, people not productively paying into the economy, paying, for example, social security tax toward a system that's increasingly based on fewer and fewer workers. I'm not, there's a, labor supply is important. You, know, you look at something like immigration reform. So real motivation for immigration reform is to have more talented people contributing to our economy, creating jobs, you know, adding to the overall strength of our economy. So I don't, I think that certainly matters. But I think, again, you have to, you know, factor in the way in which people um, make different choices. They have different options. And when health costs are lower, you know, we as a country have a better set of options than we would have otherwise had. Jason Wynn, um, when I, you said you disputed the, the total, so just from the individual perspective, when an individual works fewer hours every week in order to access a subsidy, a subsidy that the government is paying them, a government that's now getting less taxes, going to what Mark was just saying, less taxes from Social Security and spending all those other things, why is that good economic policy when they are intentionally working fewer hours to access a government subsidy? First of all, you know, um, you know, you're asking the same question, so I'll give mostly the same answer, which is, I think what's good economic policy is slowing the growth of health costs. What's good economic policy is encouraging entrepreneurship. What is good economic policy is, you know, having a workforce that is you know, suffering less from depression that is suffering less from physical ailments and is able to more um, productively contribute to the economy. I think in all of those respects, the Affordable Care Act is um, good for the overall economy. I think right now there are a lot of people who are making choices that um, you know, may not be the, not right now, last year, the year before, before the Affordable Care Act, there were people that were making choices that may not have been the best choices. Um, for them and for their families. This will give them new options and will make them better off as a result. And when you take all of these different economic effects into account is part of an overall economic strategy, um, including that deficit reduction that, that we briefly mentioned over there too. Friday of the month, so but but anticipating what we might be Almost talking is. what we might be talking about about lowered unemployment rate, will we see a duplication effect where people who are leaving 
the workforce because of these disincentives through the ACA are being replaced by people who are still looking for a job and trying to fill right. those, fill the worker hours that uh, obviously there's no, uh, you're saying this doesn't affect right. net demand, uh, labor demand. Will we see an artificial dampening of the unemployment rate because of this effect? Right. I think you're missing what was one of the main things in the report that I tried to call attention to at the top, which is if you're asking about you know the economy right now in 2014, the economy in 2015, the economy in 2016, a really important impact to the Affordable Care Act that CBO analyzed in their report was that the increase in demand will induce some employers to hire more workers or to increase their employees' hours during that period. That is because you put more money in the pockets of families, you help them with Medicaid, and that's going to help people be able to spend more. That's going to help the overall economy. And so not only do we have the 8 million jobs since the Affordable Care Act was signed into law, private sector jobs since it was signed into law, you also have that when you're thinking about the economy right now, when we talk about you know the jobs number for any given month right now, CBO is saying a very important effect of the Affordable Care Act, or one of the central effects that it will have right now, is increasing demand for goods and services, leading more employers to hire more workers that increase their employees' hours. Again, you know, every time there's a jobs number that is below what people expected, the number of people that go out and say that was because of the Affordable Care Act, precisely, uh, you know, this is saying that aspect of the Affordable Care Act goes in the opposite direction. It's helping jobs right now in the economy today. That's really important, and I think people have largely missed out on that um, in their reporting on Appendix C. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Is that a wrap? I wish. You owe him a lot of paint money. I do. I do indeed. Uh, you want to start again? Yeah, if I could just ask about the uh, President's meeting on Afghanistan today. Can you just tell us what the purpose of that meeting is and who specifically from DOD leadership? Sure. Given that General Dunford is in town, this is an important opportunity for President Obama to hear directly in person from his commander on the ground and other senior defense officials. The President continues to weigh inputs from military officials, as well as the intelligence community, our diplomats, and development experts, and has not yet made decisions regarding the post-2014 U.S. presence. Uh, as you heard the President say in the State of the Union, when he took office, 180,000 Americans were serving in uniform in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, today, all troops, all our troops, are out of Iraq, and more than 60,000 U.S. troops have come home from Afghanistan. With Afghan forces now in the lead for their own security, our troops have moved to a support role. Together with our allies, we will complete our mission there by the end of this year, and America's longest war will finally be over. Uh, of course, decisions about what a 2014 presence might look like uh, to achieve the two narrowly defined missions of counterterrorism and training Afghan uh, forces uh, is contingent upon the Afghan government signing the bilateral security agreement that we negotiated last year in good faith. Uh, and, you know, our issues with that, the status of that uh, BSA uh, remain as they were. In addition to General Dunford, uh, we expect Secretary, Secretary Hagel, uh, Joint Chiefs Chairman Dempsey, Vice Chairman Winnefeld, uh, General Austin, uh, and Admiral McRaven to join the meeting with the President, uh, Vice President, and other senior White House leadership. Just to follow up on that, Jay. Mm -hmm. <coughs> You've been saying for some time now that it's a matter of weeks, not months, before mm -hmm. we need to have clarity on that agreement. Uh, but it's been several weeks, and do, mm -hmm. you, do you have, how important is it that you have clarity on this in time for the NATO defense meeting in, in March? And how frustrated is the President and is the White House in general with, with President Karzai? I don't have a deadline for you. I can tell you that as each day passes uh, and we move further into this calendar year, it becomes more imperative that the Afghan government sign the agreement that was negotiated in good faith uh, so that NATO and the United States can make plans for a post-2014 troop presence. Absent a signed BSA, there will be no and can be no U.S. troops uh, beyond 2014. And uh, when you're making plans uh, for NATO, a dynamic organization with many members, and uh, around a situation like a military presence halfway around the world, uh, you need time. 
you need time to uh, prepare and you need time to plan. So that is why it is so important, in our view, that the bilateral security agreement be signed. Otherwise, NATO and the United States will have to uh, plan uh, for a contingency that does not include U.S. troops and does not include a signed BSA, or in reverse order. So uh, I think it's abundantly clear that we uh, believe it ought to be signed quickly, that it was negotiated in good faith, it was endorsed by the lawyer Jurga, and uh, we have been calling on the Afghan government to uh, sign the agreement for some time now and making clear that there is no option that includes U.S. troops on the ground in Afghanistan beyond 2014 for this narrow mission absent a signed VSA. Can you just wait for the next president? I, asked, uh, I was asked this yesterday, and I think that uh, the answer is this is not about, you know, who's president. This is about planning for 2014. And we are already into February. This agreement was negotiated after a prolonged process, a good faith process, uh, and uh, endorsed by uh, the Afghan elders represented by the lawyer Jirga, uh, and it ought to be signed. Uh, the, uh, you know, we can't wait months, as I've been saying. Uh, this has to be a matter of weeks. Yes, Mike. Afghan, yeah. Um, John McCain and Lindsey Graham came out of a closed briefing in the Senate today and uh, said the administration is floating uh, 2017 as a date, even if there is a BSA by which all American troops, including a residual force, uh, would be removed from Afghanistan, and that is the incentive, they say, for Karzai to go now and have secret talks to the Taliban. Is such a plan being considered? Well, first of all, the President's made no decisions about uh, troop numbers, as I just said, uh, if there are to be troops uh, beyond 2014, uh, if there is a signed BSA. Uh, and uh, when he makes that decision, contingent upon a BSA being signed, uh, we'll have more details for it on you. Now, I just as a general principle, I don't doubt that some senators envision uh, a world in which U.S. troops remain in Afghanistan for decades. Some senators envisioned a world in which U.S. troops remained in Iraq for decades. Uh, that's not the President's vision. John. Jake, can I ask about Appendix B? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, sure, whatever uh, Appendix B is. So uh, the uh, uh, Congressional Budget Office also <laughs> says uh, there will be two million fewer people covered under the Affordable Care Act than had previously been estimated. How big a problem is that? You're talking about the estimates for signups by the March 31st deadline. What I can tell you is uh, the issues with the website have been well documented and covered. And what is true today is that enrollment is ramping up uh, and ramping up rapidly, as we saw in December and saw uh, in January. Uh, at least up to the point where we had figures. And uh, that demonstrates the fact that there are a lot of really uh, dedicated people uh, working hard to ensure that healthcare.gov is functioning effectively for all those Americans who want to use it to get quality, affordable health insurance. And, you know, I, what, what I can tell you is come March 31st, we are confident that we will have a substantial number of people having signed up and uh, a good mix of people having signed up. The original estimate of 7 million was a CBO estimate. The new estimate of 6 million is a CBO estimate. What we know is that, uh, you know, looking at what we've seen now that the website is functioning effectively, we're going to have a significant number of Americans, because of the demand for quality, affordable health insurance, signed up for that quality and affordable health insurance. So uh, that's a good thing. That's a plus. Uh, CBO, I would note, in this report, continues to project that the law will ultimately reduce the number of uninsured by 25 million. So that uh, bottom line figure in terms of uh, the ultimate impact on the number of uninsured in this country has not changed in their report. Uh, and that reflects the fact that we are committed to covering as many Americans as possible, and we're working to achieve that goal, and we'll continue to work to achieve that goal up until March 31st and beyond. Uh, I would note, and perhaps you were going to ask this, but maybe not, uh, that the CBO in its report also, as regarding the ACA, uh, did an analysis of the so-called risk corridors that uh, Republicans have been attacking and found that uh, that provision within the ACA would save $8 billion 
eight billion dollars. Uh, I would also note that Medicare Part D, which was a law championed by and signed into law by President George W. Bush, supported by uh, many Republicans on Capitol Hill, many of the same Republicans who are trying to make an issue of this, uh, has a very similar provision in it. The only distinction is for the Affordable Care Act, it lasts three years. For Medicare Part D, it lasts forever. Thereby putting, we think it's a good program. We think it's good for Medicare Part D. We think it's good for the Affordable Care Act. The only distinction is, coming at it from the Republican critique, is that the one for Medicare Part D potentially puts Americans at risk uh, every year in perpetuity, as opposed to the Affordable Care Act, which, at least in theory, could put uh, folks at risk for three years, but in fact, according to the CBO, is leading to uh, $8 billion in savings. But back to this notion of fuel. So you might want to ask them about that proposal they have. Okay. Uh, but, but, but back to that, to this question of, of who will be covered. I know the $7 million mm -hmm. was a CBO estimate, the $9 million they estimated that would be added to, to, to Medicaid. So that, but, but they are estimating a combined 2 million fewer people will be covered than previously thought. Do you sure, and what I'm saying is by own? March 31st, we know we're going to have, we're confident we're going to have a substantial number of Americans uh, covered, both through the exchanges and through uh, expansion of Medicaid. Obviously, the second number would be a lot larger if Republican governors around the country, although there have been a no number who have taken the step to expand Medicaid in their states, uh, rejecting the ideological uh, opposition that we've seen here. Uh, a number of them continue to deny their own constituents the opportunity to have access to health care through Medicaid uh, that the Affordable Care Act offers. So that number would be even bigger. But what I'm saying is by March 31st, we're going to have a substantial number. I dare say a much more substantial number than many in this room were predicting uh, a month or two or three months ago. And again, looking at the CBO estimate, uh, they are still saying that the endpoint number, the number of uninsured Americans who will be insured because of the Affordable Care Act has not changed. So regardless of the impact of the website's trouble on those who sign up by March 31st, and again, I would say that just looking at their analysis, and it's their analysis, that that impact is uh, not as severe as a lot of the folks in this room would have expected, certainly not as severe as a lot of our critics uh, hoped and expected. Uh, the end point will still be 25 million Americans with insurance who didn't have it before. And just a political question. Uh, th this report, the combined conclusions, 2 million fewer workers, uh, 2 million fewer people covered. H how worried are you about the political impact of this report? Obviously, Republicans are already using it to hammer sure, health care. And they are. And, and what I can tell you is, uh, you know, we're uh, out here with President's chief economist trying to explain the, the facts of this and, and, and what CBO is saying, what they're not saying, what factors uh, they explicitly state did not go into that analysis, factors that Jason made clear he believes uh, would be counterbalancing to uh, the estimate in terms of fewer uh, RTEs uh, or FTEs, full-time uh, employees. Uh, and I think that overall here uh, we're talking about an Affordable Care Act that's providing affordable quality health insurance to million, uh, millions of Americans. We're talking about an Affordable Care Act that's reducing the deficit by a trillion dollars uh, as projected in the past and as projected today. We're talking about an Affordable Care Act uh, that is, as the CBO states, creating incentives for employers to hire more workers in real time. We're talking about an Affordable Care Act because of its dramatic effect on health care costs is uh, potentially anyway, according to other economists' analysis, going to create uh, 250 to 450,000 more jobs uh, annually. Uh, and that's not taken into account by this uh, CBO analysis. So, uh, and, then, and then the broader point here uh, that I think Jason made, but is important, uh, and, and I, I think a little clarity is required here in terms of Ed's question. When somebody decides for himself or herself not to work 64 hours, but to work instead for 35 hours, even though the option of working more hours and potentially having the extra money that that option provides uh, is available to them. They're making a choice about their overall quality of life and perhaps pursuing something, either a new entrepreneurial uh, opportunity or a new job that, uh, in which they could be more productive and they're choosing to spend more time with their family. Uh, I think the analysis to Social Security and Medicare is apt because there's no question that pro providing insurance for elder elderly Americans uh, reduce the number of elderly Americans in the workforce. Uh, and that was a good thing for the overall health of the country and the overall 
economy of the country. What you had as a result of Social Security is a dramatic reduction in the number of seniors in poverty. Uh, so it would be weird if somebody were arguing that uh, we should do away with not just the Affordable Care Act for this reason, but some of these other programs that provide uh, substantial benefits that improve vastly the quality of life of millions of Americans. Uh, yes, Mark. Yeah, Jay, Afghanistan, uh, if the President's not made his decisions already, is today's meeting for General Dunford to make his recommendation to the President? Uh, well, first of all, the President interacts with uh, his commanders, including General Dunford, uh, uh, with some regularity. Some General Dunford General is in President town, so he's having a face-to-face -face meeting instead of a civets meeting or, uh, or a phone uh, meeting. Uh, civets meaning secure video teleconference, but uh, which, uh, which is how the President uh, communicates with the General when he's uh, in theater. So, so typically these things, they give a formal presentation. Sure, and the President, all the debate, the president will think. be uh, as he already has, uh, weighing inputs from his military uh, commanders and military officials uh, at the Department of Defense, as well as the intelligence community, as he looks at uh, his options and looks at uh, a decision about what a post-2014 presence would look like. So that decision will not come today. Uh, and uh, it is also obviously contingent upon the Afghan government signing the BSA. But this is the opportunity for Dunford to make this formal presentation. I think you're misunderstanding what I said. The President has been communicating with his general in Afghanistan for some time prior to this meeting. This is an opportunity for them to meet face to face because General Dunford happens to be in Washington. So I just don't want to create the impression that this is the only occasion that General Dunford would be able to present his view from uh, the ground to the President because the President has availed himself of that uh, already. Uh, let me go to Patty. Talk to Egyptian officials about their crackdown on the media, specifically the arrest of Al Jazeera's journalists. Uh, let me get to that. The matter that you raise is of deep concern to the administration. Uh, the restrictions uh, on freedom of expression in Egypt are a concern, and, and that includes the targeting of Egyptian and foreign journalists and academics simply for expressing their views. These figures, regardless of affiliation, should be protected and permitted to do their jobs freely in Egypt. Egypt's transition can only move forward if all Egyptians are free to express themselves peacefully without fear of intimidation or violence. Egypt's newly approved constitution upholds basic rights and freedoms, and Egypt's interim government has a responsibility to ensure that they are protected. Now, we have expressed these concerns directly to the government of Egypt in answer to your question. And we have strongly urged the government to drop these charges and release those journalists and academics who have been detained. Would you consider cutting aid if it continues? I, I think that we are expressing very directly the fact that we're deeply concerned that this uh, contravenes the uh, very Constitution, that it provides the freedoms uh, that we uh, hold dear and we believe the Egyptian people hold dear. And uh, we're making that clear to the Egyptian government. Like the Egyptians they, working in the United States, people perhaps who might be making YouTube videos. I'm sorry, does what apply? Does that law's defense of free speech apply to Egyptians who are working in the United States, including those who are making YouTube videos <coughs> that annoy people? Uh, I'm not sure of your point, but our defense of free speech is uh, very strong. Dave. Another topic. Um, last week, uh, Evan Madero's fantasy was quoted in a Japanese publication as saying that the U.S. has warned China specifically that if they create a new air defense zone in the South China Sea, that would result in an increase in U.S. Uh, pr military presence and military posture in the region. Is that, that sounded like a bit stronger language than mm -hmm. Vice President Biden used at his trip to China last December. Is that intended, was that intended by the administration to sort of heighten well, we are consequences very, on China? Well, we have expressed very clearly, both Vice President Biden and others, uh, uh, our view that uh, uh, there needs to be a reduction in tensions around uh, these issues, and uh, we have uh, made that clear in all of our communications, both private and public. So I don't, I don't think uh, what you're citing is inconsistent with our position or where we've been. About the military posture and increase in the military. Budget. Well, I, I don't have any more for you on that, David, except that our. You know, there's nothing specific about what that means exactly. I don't, I don't, even, I don't have anything more than uh, what you have from Evan on the record, Brianna. Um, it, it sort of sounds like when when Jason was talking about 
puts and takes that he's saying some people will be liberated by the law, some people will be more entrepreneurial, but some people may be, you know, while admitting what's in the CBO report that there may be this trend, some people may make the calculation or the choice, as it says in the report, not to work. And he cited, you cited positive examples, but there's also some negative examples as well. Is that an admission that there are some winners and losers here when you're talking about people who want to participate in the workforce? There is nothing as documented. There's nothing here that by giving you the option of uh, affordable and quality health insurance, we're not giving you, uh, uh, that's not a negative thing. That's a positive addition to the choices before you. So uh, as the CBO report makes clear, even as it acknowledges that it's not even taking into account a whole uh, group of factors that would have an effect on uh, that total number in terms of uh, full-time employees into the future. Uh, it is even acknowledging that uh, none of this effect that they've cited has to do with uh, a reduction in demand from businesses. This is all about choices created by uh, the availability of quality affordable health insurance. Let's imagine uh, uh, a family farm. Uh, you have uh, perhaps the husband works the farm, uh, the wife might work or vice versa might work uh, somewhere else because she or he can get health insurance for the family through that job. This affords the opportunity uh, for that individual to, and maybe that could be a job that uh, is not very rewarding or isn't, uh, may not pay that well or may not uh, be the best use of his or her talents uh, and, and may prevent uh, the man or woman from spending time with young children, right? So that creates an opportunity that has a net benefit for that family, for the community, and broadly speaking, because of all the other positive effects of the ACA for the economy. So again, creating that kind of choice for people is a good thing. It creates the opportunity to get out of job lock where you are afraid to leave your job because uh, you might lose health insurance, you won't start a business, you won't take another job that uh, might give you more opportunity in the future. So you create a lot of dynamism in the economy, and I think this is one of the things that Jason was getting at, that, you, that is hard to measure but is real. Uh, and, and very positive for the economy. So, let me follow on that, because mm -hmm. you're talking about a, a working family with a man and a woman, and I mean, increasingly men are sharing child-rearing uh, responsibilities. Mm -hmm. But in that situation, you might argue that it would be the mother who decides uh, that she is going to stay home and reduce her hours. Are you concerned that maybe what one I'm of saying the side is effects is that women might participate in no, the workforce? No, no, no. I, I think that what the... But your example the, speaks to that. But, well, first of all, it could be in any family because uh, I think the trends uh, demonstrate more, uh, certainly I know this, from, uh, you know, uh, fathers uh, doing more in the child-rearing uh, area. But the, but the fact is that it creates more op options and opportunity for... I do my best, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Should have seen this morning. Um, <laughs> but, but what it does is create options for that family. So that, I mean, in that case, whether it's the, the, the man or the woman in that family, you know, the father or the, or the mother in that family who uh, is looking to change an employment situation uh, and has that opportunity now because of, uh, because of the Affordable Care Act, they don't have to. And this goes to Ed's point. That's, this is not... Uh, anything but an added choice that they have that allows them more freedom, uh, to use a certain buzzword, more choice, uh, and, uh, and, and more opportunity because of that freedom and that choice. Bill? Yes, ma'am. What's the President's plan on that? To uh, sign it immediately or when should we expect it? I don't have a scheduling it? update for you. I can tell you that uh, uh, we will, um, well, let me see if I have any official language before I... Uh, um, well, first of all, I, as you know, the President has long been saying that Con this is something, and we identified it in the fall, this is something that Congress uh, had an opportunity to demonstrate that it can work in a bipartisan way to get done. Uh, it, and it is uh, obviously taken longer than uh, we had hoped, but it is a very positive thing when, uh, as was the case with the budget deal and the omnibus, when Republicans and Democrats can come together and compromise in a way that reflects not everybody getting everything they want, in fact, no one getting exactly what he or she wanted, uh, but uh, a deal that protects the President's priorities uh, and uh, addresses all of the needs that are addressed by a farm bill. So I don't have a scheduling update from the President, um, but we certainly uh, welcome the development.
Thanks, Jen. Alexis, uh, oh no, Jen. No. Jen, was you? Well, sorry, okay. and then and then Alexis, sure. No, go. Alexis, you're first. So, one question: yeah. The president's meeting with House Democrats this afternoon. We're not going to have a chance to see him. Could you please tell us uh, what he hopes to accomplish in that meeting? Could you expand on the meeting he had yesterday with Senator Reid that we were not bright enough to ask you was a political meeting? And could you comment on whether we'll get access to him tomorrow with the senators, Senate Dems? That was exactly my question. That's a lot <laughs> of questions. Uh, the the uh, meeting this afternoon or the visit by House Democrats here is uh, one in which, uh, as I think was the case when we had Senate Democrats, the President looks forward to uh, socializing with House Democrats and uh, to uh, talking about them, talking with them about the shared priorities uh, that they have when it comes to uh, taking action, uh, whether it's on extending unemployment insurance, uh, emergency benefits, or on raising the minimum wage, uh, action that can uh, expand opportunity and reward hard work uh, here in the United States. So uh, that would be the general nature of uh, today's event. And I think if you look at that and meetings with Senate Democrats, meeting with Ho House Democrats, it's part of an overall approach running up to and in the wake of the State of the Union address where uh, the President is meeting with uh, Democrats who share his priorities and vision when it comes to taking action to strengthen the middle class and to uh, provide ladders of opportunity into the middle class and to invest where we can get the best bang for our buck, for example, with uh, pre-K uh, for all and uh, or infrastructure that creates job in infrastructure investments that create jobs today and uh, long-term economic benefits for the country. So these are the kinds of things the President will be discussing in uh, all those meetings. And I think that the on your last question about yesterday's meeting, uh, I think it's been amply read out. Uh, obviously, again, this has to do with overall uh, views of uh, the priorities the President laid out and how to move forward on them. And that includes, I would say, you know, as we've been saying all along, obviously his intention to act uh, using the powers he has uh, when Congress won't or where Congress can't, uh, but working with Congress. Raising the minimum wage is a great example. Getting the farm bill done is a great example uh, so that we can uh, move the country forward see it continue economic growth and job creation. So no coverage tomorrow? No coverage? I, I don't have any, you know, when we put out guidance, we'll, we'll have it. But I, I don't think we normally exactly cover. Exactly the sort of thing you'd, you'd want us to cover. Gavel to gavel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be interesting. Jen, did you have any? That was it? You just had a, like, Literally my question. cool coverage question? We would okay. like to hear the, the Q&A part of this. <coughs> I bet you would. Take care. Thanks a lot.